afternoon. My name is Hunter Steinmetz. And I'm the high school pastor here at Hermitage Church of the Nazarene. I had the privilege of being Ambria's pastor for over a year now. On the behalf of the McGregor family, we would like to thank you for your attendance today, whether that's in person or if you are joining us online or on any of our overflow rooms. We gather today to celebrate the life of Ambria Diane McGregor and to be near and draw close to her grieving family. I was not asked to make this request, but I am asking so that the family does not have to. As you can imagine, expenses have run high for the McGregors and will continue to come. We ask that you give to the GoFundMe that will support them. If you're watching online, we will post the GoFundMe link in the comments. If you're in person, you can scan the QR code on the screen behind me or on the signs just inside the back doors. The burden for the family is already great enough and this is a tangible way for us to relieve and share in a very real burden for them. Thank you for everyone who has already participated. Thank you for every prayer that you have prayed, for every text that you have sent, every hug you have given, and every tear you have wiped away. No one is prepared for this, but we are grateful for a community who refuses to allow anyone to suffer alone. We share the burden together and we commit to continue to share the burden with you. Will you pray with me? Father, we are not supposed to be here. This is not what Ambria or any of us deserves, but this is where we are. And we ask that you would continue to be with us just as you have never left us. We know that this was a tragic accident that you did not cause but we believe that you have been with us the entire time, never leaving our side as you have wept alongside of us. Help us to remember Ambria today. Help us to honor her. Help us to celebrate her. Help us to be near to her family and to hold them close. We ask these things in your son's name, amen.
you guys pray with me? Heavenly Father, we love you. And Lord, you tell us where two or three gather in your name, there you'll be. And so, Lord, it is an honor to be in your presence. In a room full of community and friends and family. Lord, we put your name on high, Jesus. Knowing that you are here. Knowing, Lord, that you have no rival and you have no equal. And so, Lord, we just say thank you. And we love you and we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. My name is Kyle. I uh, get the opportunity to serve at Cross Point Church. Um, in Nashville and um, a longtime friend to the McGregors and I just want to say um, thank you first and foremost just to um, to the team here at Hermitage um, Church of the Nazarene and Hunter and Matt and Carol and um, all of your staff here for for allowing us to share the platform today as a as a community that, that just loves Jesus to celebrate the life of Ambria uh, but I just want to say thank you to you guys I want to share with you um, Psalm 23. It says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He make me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know, there's a lot of things that I like about the 23rd Psalm. It's, it's written by David. I like that a former shepherd uses the illustration of God as his shepherd. David knew intimately what a good shepherd meant to his sheep. He knew that the job and what it required. And, he, and even if David wrote this psalm from the comforts of his own kingdom, he still understood his own need for a shepherd. And I like that David used the word my. The Lord is my shepherd. He doesn't say ours. He doesn't cast a wide net to include the world at large. It is a personal declaration. The Lord is my shepherd. He cares for me, watches over me, preserves me. And I like the imagery of green pastures and still waters. You know, we have a lot of those in Tennessee, and it, and it does feel peaceful. I like that it says, he makes me lie down that our great shepherd knows that we need rest. He knows better than us what we need. And these words are full of comfort and care. And in our grief and in our pain, green pastures and still waters can seem so far away. And we long for them and wonder how long it will be until we experience them again. And so I like that the shepherd will lead us to them. He will tell us to lie down, that he is leading. He's not just someone that we are pulling along with us in this pain, that we will find the peace of still waters because that is where he will lead us to. The psalm turns a little dark in verse 4. It says, yea, though I'll walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It acknowledges something that is true for all of us that our faith in Christ and the salvation we enjoy does not spare us from the pain of this life. But there are some really important words to take note of in verse four. And the first one is through. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. So make no mistake, this valley is not our destination. It is not our home. He will, we will not reside in the shadow of death, though at times we may have to pass through. 
our shepherd will lead us to the other side. He will not forget us, nor will he forsake us. He will not leave us here in this pain. The other word to pay attention to is shadow. And I like that David used the word because I quit being afraid of shadows a, a long time ago. I hope you did too. The valley of the shadow of death sounds daunting, but remember how little power a shadow actually has. Because of the cross, the power of death has been taken away, and that all that remains is its shadow. And where there is shadow, there must also be light nearby. It's C.H. Spurgeon that said, Death stands by the side of the highway in which we have to travel, and the light of heaven shining upon him throws a shadow across our path. Let us then rejoice that there is a light beyond. Nobody is afraid of a shadow, for a shadow cannot stop a man's pathway even for a moment. The shadow of a dog cannot bite. The shadow of a sword cannot kill. The shadow of death cannot destroy us. Now, I like the confidence of the close of the psalm. It says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know, there are times in my life where I must be reminded of his goodness and, and his mercy. As a pastor, I spend a lot of time pouring and pointing other people to his goodness and his mercy. But um, in loss, I'm reminded that we are desperate for it ourselves. That our hope is found in his goodness and his mercy. And I like the reminder that this despair that we feel is, will, not, will not follow us all the days of our life. That sadness will come from time to time but it will not follow us every step of the way. That tears are cleansing and mourning is important and loss is unavoidable, but the thing that will accompany, accompany us on every step of the journey is his goodness and his mercy. And I don't know how all the Psalms were written and organized, but there's an interesting pattern that emerges when you look at David's writings, specifically in Psalm 22, 23, and 24. Psalm 22 begins with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And if that sounds familiar, it's because the passage that Jesus quoted as he, as he hung on the cross. And Psalm 22 is lamenting, it's dark. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. And then Psalm 24 is totally different, it's full of faith. It turns, it says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. And in between these two passages is the 23rd Psalm. And it bridges the gap. It's the, the journey of lamenting and the, the anguish we see on, in Psalm 22. And then the confidence restored and the hope restored in, in Psalm 24. And I'd imagine that that's a journey that all of us are on right now. I know that's the journey that, that Ryder and Brittany and Dylan and this family is on right now. And there's a strong sense that, that we should not be here today, that something is wrong in the world, that when we gather a memorial, we, sh we should gather to remember a full life. And it, it just feels unjust that, that, that we don't have that opportunity. Although we only had 16 years with Ambria, we have confidence that her creator knows her well. The scriptures say that even before she was formed in the womb, that her heavenly father knew her and consecrated her. It is a relationship that she had with Jesus is why we can be confident that we will later have the opportunity to see her again. And that further relationship with her isn't taken away. It's simply delayed. And we believe that God has received Ambria into his arms and she is safe there. And we also gather to honor Ryder and Brittany and Dylan. They love us well and so we covet the opportunity to love them back. We don't gather here because we all understand what they're going through or because we all have the answers. We're not here to offer just empty platitudes as though the healing process was just simple as just cheering up. And we gather because they are walking through the valley of the shadow of death, and we don't want them to walk alone. The instinct to draw close to the brokenhearted is just one of the many ways that it's evident that we're created in the image of God. That his character is inside each and every one of us. You're in this room because 
you carry the character of God that you desire to be close to the brokenhearted. We mourn with those who mourn and we rejoice with those who rejoice. And it's because that's what our Heavenly Father does. If I go back to the 23rd Psalm, there's a little, this beautiful idea in verse 3, and earlier I read it in the King James Version. It's, it's beautiful and poetic rhythm to that version, but there's another translation from the message that's just much more conversational and modern, and I, and I love the way it captures verse 3. It says this, true to your word, you let me catch my breath and send me in the right direction. And that's my prayer for today. Father, would you help us all catch our breath? Would you place our feet on solid ground? And would you steady, steady us? And then will you send us in the direction of healing? Will you restore our joy and fill us with your hope? And one of the ways that I, I feel that hope being restored is through songs. And when I hear the beauty of God's words sung out, it just brings peace. And Ambria used to stand beside her mom. Every Sunday. And pass out programs. To people as they entered into our auditorium for worship. And Brittany told me, she said, she used to get mad. Because Brittany would give people the program before Ambria could do it. <laughs> and I had this thought the other day that, that Ambria loved to, to usher people into the presence of God from a very early age. And I imagine her doing that exact same thing right now in heaven. That our God looked upon her as she entered into the kingdom and said, well done, well done, good and faithful servant. So I got my friend Paul. And uh, as Paul sings this next song, let's all be ushered into the presence of our God together.
Oh. Got to put on my glasses. Amory made fun of me for that. <laughs> Can't see anything. Um, as I look around this room, I'm full of gratitude. We cannot thank you all enough for the prayers and support we have received over the last three and a half weeks. The love we have felt from you and the strength we have gained because of you is appreciated more than we can put into words. I'm going to ask that you continue to lift us up as the days, weeks, months, and years pass. I'm also going to ask you to not stop talking about Ambria. I've said this to several of her friends, but I want to say it to all of you. Please share stories and keep her memory alive by speaking her name aloud. Don't be afraid to talk about her. We want to hear her name now and always. At this time, as I've asked so many of you so many times before, I'd like for each of you to offer up just a silent prayer for comfort and strength for the three of us as we attempt to pay tribute to our beautiful daughter, Dylan's beloved sister, Ambria. So if you could just silently pray in your hearts that we will have the strength to do this right now, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I decided to write a letter to Ambria, and I made the decision to keep it in the present tense because she lives on fully restored and fully whole. So here we go. <laughs> My dearest Ambria, I don't even know how to begin to write something that adequately honors you, but I'm going to try my best. I'm going to start with your eyes. You have the most beautiful brown eyes I have ever seen. When I first looked into them on October 2nd, 2006, I saw a certain sparkle, a twinkle. The light that shines through your eyes is something special and obvious to anyone who has ever looked into them. Next is your smile. You truly have a smile capable of lighting up any and every room you have ever entered. There's a true warmth behind your smile that makes everyone around you feel welcomed. That leads me to your laugh. Several people, including myself, have described your laugh as contagious, and that is 100% accurate. Others don't even have to know what you're laughing about. They simply hear you laugh, and in a matter of seconds, they are laughing too. I can think of numerous moments that you and I laughed hysterically with no spoken words until our jaws ached and stomachs hurt. How I will forever cherish those memories. As much as I love looking into your eyes, seeing your smile, and hearing your laugh, your heart might be my favorite feature. Your heart is kind. Your heart is loving. Your heart is as good as gold. You genuinely care for people and make a conscious effort to try to see the best in everyone around you. You possess empathy on a level people three times your age are often incapable of feeling. You hold Jesus close in your heart, and that started at a very young age. I'll never forget you telling me you wanted to get baptized. At first, I thought you were too young that maybe you couldn't fully comprehend what it meant. After a few conversations with you, though, I quickly learned you knew exactly what you wanted and fully understood. Being given the opportunity to baptize you myself will forever be one of the most cherished experiences of my life. In addition to your caring heart, you have a work ethic unmatched by most people your age. If I'm being totally honest, it is unmatched by most adults. For as long as I can remember, you have been self-motivated and given 110% to everything you do, at school, at church, on the volleyball court, wherever. You have completed your homework, studied for tests, and finished projects without any direction from me or your dad, and managed to maintain straight A's throughout your school career. You have set your alarm to get up for school. You have exercised regularly, made sure to eat nutritious foods, mixed in with some junk, of course, and even floss your teeth daily. You have been disciplined in your walk with God, reading your Bible and journaling routinely. You have always taken care of yourself physically, emotionally, and spiritually, and I have always admired that about you. Another thing I've always admired and appreciated about you is how invested you've always been in our relationship. When you were little, you always wanted me to play Barbies or school with you. We did that almost every day, and I will forever be thankful for that time. As you got a little older, we both tried to force the continuation, 
But it became obvious that we needed to find another activity. It took some time and I felt like we were becoming a little disconnected. Then we found the guest experience team at Cross Point. We became greeters on Sunday mornings and I loved standing next to you welcoming people as they entered the church auditorium. That became our special time together. Then you became a teenager and I once again felt the pain of a disconnect. Yes, we continued to go places and do things together, but as your mom, I wanted more. One day you asked me if we could go for a drive. Nowhere in particular, just drive. We did. We drove to the lake, then we proceeded to drive all over Mount Juliet. This became our new thing, and I'm forever grateful. I'm forever grateful for the days and nights driving with the music up and the windows down, often racing to catch the sunset at the lake. Sometimes we'd talk, sometimes we wouldn't, but it didn't matter. We were together and we enjoyed it either way. I know that I'm going to continue to do that, and I know you will continue to ride with me, but my heart hurts to know I won't be able to reach over and hold your hand. It hurts my heart that we can't run to Dutch Bros or Starbucks together. It hurts my heart to not have my sushi eating buddy here with me in a physical sense. It breaks my heart to not have one of my favorite people, my best friend here with me. That being said, I know we will be reunited one day and I will look forward to that until it happens. I wanna thank you for being my daughter and for being the best one you could have been. Thank you for trusting me, for literally talking to me about everything. Thank you for laughing with me. Thank you for your patience in trying to teach me TikTok dances that I could never seem to grasp. Thank you for understanding me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for being such a bright light and pure joy in my life and the lives of countless others. Thank you for making me proud. I will spend the rest of my life trying to make you proud. Even on the days when it's hard to breathe, I will try my best to remain Ambria strong. I will love you forever and ever, and I will see you soon. Until then, I'll look for you everywhere I go. I'll see you in the beautiful sunsets, feel you in the whisper of the wind, and hear you in the calling of the ocean. Rest easy and fly high, my beautiful rainbow baby. Love always, Mama. I start I want to say thank you all the people here you've been for us by praying your absolute heart out my family and I will never ever be able to thank you enough we love all of you to the moon and back to all the nurses Hannah C Hannah S Emily G Emily F Faith Jesse Mercedes Maddie Sarah Omni Allie and Olivia we cannot speak highly enough of you all. Those of you that are here, you might be uncomfortable, but please stand real quick. <laughs> Next thing I was gonna say for a round of applause, so thank you. <sighs> they fully deserve it. They have laughed with us, they have cried with us. They have seen us at literally the lowest point of my family and I's lives and gave us a shoulder to cry on as they cried with us. I will speak for my family when I say I love you all. You all have hearts of pure gold. We are y'all's biggest fans and cannot wait to see where life continues to take you all. Miss Beverly, we're pretty convinced you're an angel. You brought us an unexplainable peace every time you walk into the room. We love you. All right, harder part. <laughs> Ambria, 
my heart, my soul, my pride, my world, my reason why, my light, my best friend, my baby sister. Never would I have ever thought I would be having to do what I'm doing right now. Never would I have thought I would have to listen to mom do it and dad about to do the exact same thing. Never would I have thought that we would feel the sharp of a pain, this amount of sadness, this amount of hurt, this amount of emptiness. Never would I have ever thought my heart would be this shattered. No one should ever have to do this ever, but here we are. I still remember the day you were born at Centennial Hospital. I stepped out of the room because I wanted you in this world, but Lord knows I didn't want to see how you came into this world. <laughs> From that day forward, I took it as my responsibility to protect you as your big brother. If it was up to me, anything would have to go through me to get to you. Also, as your big brother, that means I'm supposed to aggravate the crap out of you. I like to think I did a pretty good job at doing both. <laughs> Although there's nothing I could have done different the night of December 7th, I still have this feeling of guilt. I'm not saying it would make it anything better for mom and dad, and I would trade places with you in an instant. Whatever you had your mind eventually set that you were going to do in your time here on earth, you're going to absolutely strive at. I already know that you were absolutely striving in heaven. Give Lexi all the belly rubs and give Sandy all the palm massages they want until we join you up there at those port pearly gates. The way we all can guarantee that is to live our lives like her. Have compassion for others, have a love that goes beyond words, and have a soul that loves the Lord. The hardest I ever laughed was with you. One of the many times. One day when we were at McDonald's going to pick one day when we were going to pick up mama from work, we went to McDonald's to get some fries and a milkshake like we did all the time. We always had pretty good luck with the ice cream machine working. <laughs> when I was asking for my chocolate shake, my voice cracked like I was a 13-year-old that was just now going through puberty. It took me a solid minute to be able to get any more words out of my mouth to complete my order because we couldn't quit laughing. Your laugh made everything 10 times more funny. We got to the window, got our stuff, and drove away. We didn't go very far though because I had to almost immediately pull over because I couldn't drive anymore because we were both laughing so hard. We both couldn't breathe and both had tears pouring out of our eyes. Just one of the many times we both made each other do that to one another. Life on this earth is forever changed for us. Every Sunday night, we would go get our fries and milkshakes like I had mentioned before. We won't do that again on earth. We won't be able to go out there and play football together as a family and have you absolutely break mama's ankles while you ran a sluggo for a touchdown. We won't be able to do that again on earth. Let me tell y'all, I have a whole lot of pride in the way I taught her how to catch and throw the most beautiful spiral I've ever seen. None of you boys can throw one better, and I hope you all feel embarrassed by that. <laughs> I won't be able to see you stand in the weirdest position possible when you brush your teeth and make fun of you every time I saw you. She would literally stand like a flamingo sometimes. I never understood why. She never did either. That won't happen again on earth. I won't be able to walk into your room to annoy you anymore just because I could. That won't happen again on earth. And I say all that because if I live my life like you, I'll be able to do all that again when we're in heaven. My great aunt Betty sent us a message that I can't quit reading. She lost her son in a car accident too. His name was Dylan. She said to us, there are no words that I can say that will help you in this moment. I have spent most of the day trying to find words to help you, words that will bring you comfort, but I know there aren't any. It will be so hard to be alive for a while. Breathe deep, hang on, sleep, eat, cry, remember. 
I'm so sorry you have to walk this road. Here are some things that you need to remember. You are not alone. This place you now live is filled with others that walk this road ahead of you, beside you, and follow you. There are thousands of people across the U.S. that have and are praying for you because your 16-year-old girl touched so many lives. She will never be forgotten. She is already hugging Jesus. You will no longer think of death as your great biggest fear because you now see it as a reward. <laughs> you no longer have a greatest fear because you have already faced it. People will tell you, you're so strong. We admire your faith. How do you do it? Well, you really don't have a choice. You could not give your life for hers. That option isn't available. God chose her and we were left to figure out why. Maybe it was to bring all these people praying together closer to God. Maybe it was to show her young classmates and friends that life is short and to be kinder to each other because you may never get the chance to say, I'm sorry. Maybe it was to bring a better life to those who will benefit from her beautiful, beautiful donation of her organs. Count your blessings every time you feel you're falling. You got to say goodbye. So many don't get this chance. You have your faith. So many don't. I can't imagine the pain of losing a child and thinking I will never, ever get to see them again. You have each other and your extended family. There is a rainbow and it's just really hard to see through the tears, but it is there. Your life will never be normal again. Everything will feel different, but that's okay because it is different. Don't rush to make things normal. Take your time. I have never read something that hit me so hard as they're saying, you will no longer think of death as your biggest fear because you now see it as a reward. It's the most accurate thing I've ever read. I can't wait to see you again, bubbas. Every step and every breath I take for the rest of my life is for you until I see you again. I wouldn't trade the 16 years, two months, and six days you were on this earth for anything. You are my guardian angel for the rest of my life. Every night for as long as I can remember, we would tell each other goodnight the exact same way. We would give each other a hug, hold each other, You'd wait for me to raise, a hand, to raise my hand, and we'd raise each other's off our backs, and we'd tap each other four times on the back and say, you're a good buddy at the same time. You would then say, love you, bro, and then I would say, love you, sis, and give you a kiss on the top of your head. Forever will I take with me that the last words I ever heard you say were, love you, bro. Every time I feel down, I just have to keep saying that to myself. Amber is strong isn't just a saying, it's a way of life. I hope you all join me in living that way of life by honoring that girl with the prettiest brown eyes and most beautiful smile I've ever seen. Amber Diane McGregor, you're a good buddy. Love you, sis. all you guys. <clears throat> wow. I don't know how I'm going to be able to match what was just said by those two. <clears throat> First, I want to thank everybody for being here. Uh, I'm not a very good talker in normal conversation, let alone being up here on the stage. I'm going to try my hardest for my baby girl. Uh, thank all of y'all for being here. You guys are really giving us strength. And I've been loving every hug. And I'm not a hugger, but I think I might be from this point forward. My name's Ryder McGregor. I am so proud and honored to be the daddy of the angel we are all here celebrating today. Before I get into my message, I'd like to give some thanks 
first of all, <clears throat> I would like to thank every one of you for being here today. I believe we have family and friends from eight states outside of Tennessee in attendance. Wisconsin, Minnesota, South Dakota, North Dakota, Colorado, Arizona, Florida, Kentucky. I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable. And we'll never be able to thank you guys enough for being here. It means the world to us. And I promise Amber is just as proud and honored as Brittany Dillon and I. Thank all of you for the prayers and support you've shown us over these last three weeks. We're truly humbled and overwhelmed by the outpouring of support we have received by our family, friends, our community, and even people we've never even met before. We're eternally grateful. We drove here today. We took the little back road, and there was purple ribbons the entire way, all five miles, I mean, the entire way down, the Ambria Strong signs. It was great. It was. We're so, so humbled and honored. Thank you so much. Next, I wanna thank the nurses. Um, a lot of what I'm gonna say is probably a repeat of what they said, but it's, it's all good. I can't thank them enough, you guys. You were amazing. You help us, helped us through the toughest time in our lives. We consider you all part of our family now, and we cannot thank you enough for taking extra shifts, like I know many of you did, just because you knew you wanted to come in and help our baby girl. <clears throat> you, you celebrated with us, you cried with us, and you will always hold a spot in our hearts. We didn't get the results we wanted, unfortunately, but God had other plans for our baby. I also want to thank the first responders that night and the the neighbors and the people that were there that night for her. I don't, I know we wouldn't even have got the three weeks we got if y'all didn't do such a great job and we're, we'll be forever grateful to you all as well. I think I might skip over this next part a little bit. I hear my baby girl in my head saying, Died. That's the way she said it now. I'll valley like that all the time. Died. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to get a few things off my chest that bothered us a little, but I'll just briefly mention them instead of going into the detail that I have wrote down here. The highway patrolman that night, I just feel like he... Uh, put every little charge he could against her driving, and it was just a simple accident. I, I just, that in to the county, whichever, Wilson, Davidson, all counties, if y'all get this message, I will hope that you guys will be proactive from now on instead of reactive on these dangerous curvy roads like the one that our daughter encountered. And now the, I say proactive because there was no guardrail. And since this has happened, now there is a guardrail, which should have been there the whole time. All right, I'll move on, sorry. I think that brings us a little peace there. And I have the utmost respect for law enforcement. I want to make sure that's loud and clear. That All right. As for my message or my tribute, I really don't know where to start. So I guess I'll let you guys know a little bit about me and my journey to uh, becoming the Christian I am today. This is the hardest thing, obviously, I've ever had to go through. I thought. Four years ago in 2018, when I lost my grandfather, who was a very powerful father figure in my life, 
in February of 2018. And then losing my mom four months later was as hard as things could get. But man, I was so wrong. Here's a little about myself and my faith. My mother gave birth to me two months after her 18th birthday on the Standing Rock Indian Reservation in a small town in South Dakota. She was still a kid trying to raise a baby. As you can imagine, this led to some hard times for her and led to some hardships and insecurities for me as a child. That being said, I truly believe she did the best she could considering her circumstances and with the help of some unbelievable grandparents that I was blessed with. She may not have done everything right, but she did the most important thing right. And I hope any of you single moms out there hear this. She took me to church in catechism slash AKA Sunday school pretty much every week. She made sure she did that for me. And to this day, I'm a very spiritual person because of that. I'm not so much religious, but I am very spiritual. I don't have a problem with any religion. I truly believe in whatever religion that makes you believe in the higher, our higher power is right for you. I've personally felt the Lord in many different religious venues. I was able to come to find comfort in my worth through our Savior, Jesus Christ. I can remember when I was a young man on one Sunday at church when I was feeling very down, confused, and lost, and I suddenly just had this overwhelming feeling of peace and love and appreciation come over me. And I knew beyond the shadow of a doubt, it was the Holy Spirit just comforting me, letting me know my worth, my value, that I was eternally loved. I wish I could say from that point, my life was without frustration, without hurt or anger, and that I had a clear mind, a clear path, but that was not the case. However, any time I started having any of those old emotions, I knew where to find my worth and my comfort. All of this led to me wanting nothing more from life than to have a happy family one day. I've never cared about material things or money. I just wanted a happy family that would find its worth and its value from the Lord just as I did. That was my goal in life, the ultimate achievement anyone can ask for in my opinion. I met Brittany in math class in high school. I thought she was beautiful, but <laughs> no, nah. no, nah, I thought she was beautiful, but I remember she missed a lot of class because she was dealing with migraine headaches. So we didn't get to really connect much in, in that class. We reconnected a couple years later and have been together ever since. She is the most caring and passionate person I've ever met. Her external beauty is matched by her internal beauty. She's a teacher, probably the most selfless, definitely one of the most underappreciated professions you can have. And her students love her for the same reasons I do. Our story hasn't always been a fairy tale, but with our faith, we persevered and started making my dreams come true. We first had a baby boy, which was what I wanted most. <laughs> to have a son that would be my buddy and maybe play some sports if he enjoyed them as I did. That's exactly what I got and I couldn't be more proud of the man he is today. He's my golf partner to this day, and I'm sure he'll be able to beat me on a consistent basis one of these days, simply, simply due to the fact that Father Time is on his side. 
He's also my work partner and fellow full-time protector of our family baby girl. I could go on and on about my beautiful wife and amazing son, but it's time I get to my princess, my baby, my angel love. Please bear with me as I try to get through this, but I do feel like she's just giving me a lot of strength right now, so I think I'll I'm going to be okay. After a couple years of raising our son and getting Brittany finished with college, we wanted to have another baby to bring more joy to our home. We went through the heartache of miscarriage two times. That totally devastated us. But we kept trying, and we were finally blessed with our baby girl. To be honest, I was kind of hoping for another boy. <laughs> because I was scared to death of trying to raise a girl in this crazy world. But as soon as our rainbow baby was born and I looked into the prettiest brown eyes I had ever seen, I instantly felt a love like I had never known before. Don't misunderstand that I loved her more than my firstborn, my son. But a love that a daddy has for his baby girl is very unique. It's a soft, delicate, precious love like I had never felt before. She instantly had me wrapped around her finger. I'm telling you, she had the most beautiful brown eyes that looked straight into my soul from day one. Our love and the connection I felt was so powerful. And it put me into a protective dad mode like I had never felt before. I instantly started calling her princess and held her in my arms as much as I could. And I do mean as much as I could. I constantly was holding her. This led to her being the daddy's girl when she was little. I don't care if her mama disagrees. <laughs> Me and my princess had that special bond. Even I would play Barbies with her. <laughs> I fixed her hair, and I would dress her up as cute as I could. I was head over heels for my baby girl, and she knew it. She became my little fishing buddy. We have a little swampy fishing spot behind our house. And she loved it when, we, when she was a little, a little girl. She would always want to go. And as soon as I said yes, she would start putting our fishing gear in her wagon, which I'm sure you all might have seen up here on the slideshow. She would get everything in the wagon and get it ready to, to pull it down to the lake. When she was seven, she caught the biggest fish ever caught behind our house, a record that still stands to this day. It was a huge nine-pound catfish. I thought it was going to pull her and her miniature fishing pole right into the water. But she fought it while being very animated, I might add, and she reeled it in. I have a video of her reeling in a fish on our first trip down there one spring. She was so excited and proud. It's so funny to watch it now. On another occasion at our fishing spot, our whole family was down there fishing and suddenly Ambria shouts, sea snake daddy, sea snake. <laughs> and she jumped into my arms. Man, I love those moments where she knew her daddy would protect her. She also liked playing sports and started playing softball. She was very good and made multiple all-star teams. I will always cherish the numerous days at our local ballpark watching both of our children play for years. Some of my best memories, love every one of them. 
I thought she would play softball all the way through college, but then she found volleyball, and her softball days came to an abrupt stop. She loved volleyball. And I'm telling you, she was the best hustler, diving on the floor, player on her team every single year. I mean, even at practices, she'd come home with big bruises and abrasions all over her. Just, and I was like, you got to take it easy. We're going to have to put you in some football pads or something. I might be a little biased, but she had the best, most consistent serve on most of her teams as well. I mean, that's just my opinion. <laughs> she served out the final, I believe it was five points in the championship match for her undefeated eighth grade volleyball team at school. We were so proud. That following spring, she broke her finger warming up on her final match of her club volleyball season in Atlanta. She broke it during warm-ups but toughed it out and played the entire match with a broken finger. Unfortunately, the break took forever to heal and prevented her from being able to try out for her freshman year's team at school. We were so sad about that. This year, as a 16-year-old, she got moved up to play with the 17-year-olds on the upper level team at her C2 Travel Volleyball Club. We were about to be going a doing a bunch of traveling and watching her play in multiple states, and we were so excited. My baby girl and I shared the same sense of humor. We would laugh so hard at the silliest of things. One story that popped in my head was a Saturday Night Live skit <laughs> where Will Ferrell was a news anchor on a talk of, the talk of the town setting and suddenly the teleprompter quit working. You'll have to watch it for yourself, but man, did we laugh so, so hard. We watched it from time to time and we would laugh just as hard every time. As time went on, I knew the days I was always worried about in the back of my mind were slowly getting closer and closer. The days when she would start becoming a young woman. I always dreaded that thought and just wanted her to stay my baby girl forever, but I knew that wasn't possible. And become a young woman, she did. She started becoming more and more beautiful by the day, it seemed like. I knew it was just a matter of time until I would have to take a step back so my protective father mode would not interfere with our relationship. Fortunately, she had the best mom a young woman could ask for. Ambry always told us everything and was very open and honest with us. So much so that she called us one night and was so excited to tell us that she had her first kiss. <laughs> daddy didn't like that. <laughs> her daddy was not excited about this. Her mother and I went and picked her up from her friend's house the next morning. On the way home, we stopped at Kroger and Ambry and I stayed in the car while Brittany went into the store. I started crying, and I told her she was entering a very scary time for me as her daddy. As always, I told her to make sure she remembered to honor God and her family with the decisions she would be facing from this point. I totally overreacted to an innocent little kiss. <laughs> but she held my hand and cried with me. From that point, I knew 
I would have to lean on her mama to take over with the boy situations. And I would have to monitor from a step back or I would more than likely end up in jail. <laughs> Brittany handled it perfectly. And her and Ambria maintained a very open relationship while I got told of situations mainly from her mama. <laughs> she did still confide with her daddy too, but more so with her mama because her daddy would usually tell her that that boy is stupid <laughs> and he's not good enough for you. Pretty plain and simple. You know. Although she knew she was still my baby girl, she also knew I was a little overprotective. From that point, I watched her and her mama's relationship grow more and more, and I struggled with being the overprotective dad. Their relationship blossomed, and they were best friends more so than mother about her. I had been struggling recently trying to think of ways for us to bond now that she was becoming a young woman. Some way that we could bond outside of our normal life interactions at home during the week. The only thing I knew to do was remind her of the Lord and to always rely on him. I reminded her as often as I could that she would not be perfect. She would make mistakes, but our Heavenly Father would always forgive her, and he would always be there for her. This was evident in our last text, this change. I was going to read it, but I'm not going to. Yeah. She texted me one morning and said, love you, Dad. Have a good day. And she'd been going through some tough times with, you know, normal teenage situations. And I just said, oh, thank you, princess. I hope you have a great day, too. Even if things don't go how you want, just know God has your back, and he will make things better. I'm trying to do better at remembering that and not letting things get me too down. I hope you do the same when something or someone tries to bring you down. I love you so much. She was well aware uh, of this as she has always had a strong faith ever since she was a little girl. She studied, studied verses and journey, journaled about her faith for years. I know she's in a better place where she can escape the cruelness of this world, but I'm sad for the things she didn't get to experience and not being able to see what she was going to do with her self-motivated attitude. She always made straight A's, made her bed every morning, kept her room spotless and stylish. <laughs> she did all of this on her own. We never ever had to make her do her schoolwork. She just did it. We never ever had to make her clean her room or make her bed. She just did it on her own. She has gotten herself up for school for years now. As, you, as I'm sure you can tell, I could go on and on for days about my beautiful baby girl, but I guess I need to wrap things up for today. The last three weeks have been hell on earth for us, but we also are able to see the blessings we had within those three weeks. We got to hold her hand 24 hours a day for all three weeks. She literally had one of us holding her hand the entire time. We would take shifts sleeping, but somebody always had her hand. We got to tell her how much we love her, 
We got to kiss and love on her. While it was torture to see her in that condition, I am grateful that we got to tell her goodbye and love on her. We did not get the miracle we prayed for, the miracle we believed in all the way to the last day. As I've heard many of you say, she was the miracle. I pray her life and our family's faith will continue to bring some of the Lord's lost children home. Although I am proud of her for deciding to be an organ donor and saving multiple lives, my flesh is still angry with the Lord, but I know my Lord can handle that. I wouldn't wish this situation on anyone, but I am selfishly mad the Lord chose our baby girl. Although I am angry, my faith is not shook at all. If anything, it is stronger. Because I know beyond the shadow of a doubt, we will be together again one day. And what a glorious day that will be. As Dylan referred to the words from our aunt that also lost a child in a car accident, I no longer fear death whatsoever. I look forward to the day I am called home so I can reunite with my princess. <laughs> Thank you all so much from the bottom of our hearts. And please continue to pray for our family to have strength and to move on with our brokenness and find our new level of functionality. Be forever grateful to every single one of y'all. I wanted the biggest celebration possible and I was worried it might not come to fruition, but man, <laughs> you guys, I can't thank you enough for showing up. She, was, she is so proud and so happy that each one of you guys showed up to honor her, and we are eternally grateful. Thank you all so much. I 
will see the goodness of God. Your goodness keeps running out. This is running out, it's running after me. With my life laid down, surrender now. I give everything. Your goodness is running out, it's running after me. And all my life, you have. All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I make I will see of the goodness of God Yes, I will see of your goodness Ambria McGregor was a light to everyone who knew her. I've only known her for a little over a year, but I have not met someone who has told me a story about her who did not smile when they said her name. Her smile was contagious. And even in the speaking of her name, her smile affects your countenance. Ambria was quiet and shy. Unless she knew you, then she was anything but that. She had a smirk and a subtle smile that she always wore unless she was giving someone the stink eye. She was an athlete, loved being active. Growing up, she was a softball player until she discovered her love for volleyball and she gave her all to volleyball. Anytime she had the chance, she was hitting a volleyball against a wall at home or in a circle with her friends in this gym after church. She played for Mount Juliet Middle School, Alliance Airborne, and C2 Attack. She had a competitive spirit, and winning was what Ambria did. Her great-grandmother, Diane, recalled a story of the family sitting down to play cards. Everyone had sat down to play, but then Ambria and her brother Dylan got up and hugged. Her great-grandmother asked, what are you guys doing? Embry responded, making sure we win. Her Grammy said she would always play to win and intended to win everything she competed for. But if there was a prize at the end, she would give away the prize and let someone else win too. She won a lot, but her compassion always won. She was others minded, even when the attention was on her. Embria was a family girl she loved her family with all she had and knew how much her family loved her. She loved taking pictures of her family and was not afraid to be seen in pictures or videos with them. She was an avid phone stealing selfie taker. If you left your phone out near her, you could be sure that there would be some pictures of Ambria, most likely with her tongue out, in them waiting for you to enjoy weeks later when you discover them. She loved her dad, she loved her mom, she loved her brother, deeply. She loved her extended family too. Her uncle Brian talked about how kind she was to her cousins. She was always so patient with them and she embraced whatever it was they wanted to do. If she was if she was doing something she wanted to do and her cousins asked her to join what they were doing, she moved to them with compassion and immersed herself in what they were doing. Her family was the center of who she was. The girl loved the beach. She loved sunsets. She especially loved sunsets at the beach. The photo you have most likely associated with her in these last three weeks right behind me is her slight smile standing at the edge of the ocean with her feet in the sand while the sun was setting. 
Her grandpa said that many nights she and her mom would get in the car right around listening to music and stop at a place to watch the sunset. Students knew that about her too. Multiple students have talked about how Ambria loved a good sunset and always wanted to be where she could see it. She loved life and everything it had to offer. Ambria loved Jesus. Her uncle Jordan said that she was full of Jesus. and It was evident that the Holy Spirit was in her. She started attending Hermitage Church in October of 2021 on Wednesday nights and Sunday nights with her friends Lily Monterosa and Reagan and Rylan Camerata. She quickly became a part of this community and we are a better community because she came a part of us. Last Wednesday night, 45 of our high school students met here in the lobby with the pastor so that we could be together and mourn together. I had all of us sit in a circle and I told the students that we were going to tell stories about her. The stories could make us cry or laugh or both. One student said that she lived hard and that she had lived so much life in the time that she had had. They would cry during one story and then belly laugh in the next one, then cry in the next story and then belly laugh in the next one. One student told us that she didn't know Ambria and they had never even had a conversation before but that they parked three to four spaces down from each other at Green Hill High School. Every morning, Ambria would wave at her and give her that subtle smirk that we all know. She said even though they had never even spoken to each other, Ambria became a part of her routine. Her sweetness and love for Jesus shined out of her and it did not even require her opening her mouth. Students talked about how the winter retreat last February was a marker in her faith journey. Other students voiced that ever since then, they could see continual growth in her faith. She was always bettering herself and drawing near to Jesus. She posted on social media some months ago pretending that preschool Ambria was talking to present-day Ambria. Preschool Ambria asked present-day Ambria, do you still love God? present day Ambria responded, you've even found a church group where you feel right at home. And you have been growing in your faith more than ever. (laughs) It is evident in the ways that people talk about her and in the things that she made the conscious decision to do A couple of months ago, when she got her license, she checked the organ donor box and became an organ donor. She did not just talk the Jesus talk, she walked the Jesus walk. Even in her death, she chose the Jesus way. Her selfless heart gave life to eight other organ recipients. Every breath that those eight recipients will take for the rest of their lives will be because of the Christ-like selflessness that Ambria embodied. Her Christ-likeness makes this horrible tragedy somehow holy. Her Christ-likeness turns this robbery somehow into a gift. Her Christ-likeness turns our darkest night into the silent flicker of a candle that refuses to let darkness triumph. She embodied God's character, making the conscious decision that the darkness of her death would bring light to someone else's life. She loved Jesus and her life is evidenced by it. A couple of days after the accident, Lily, who was Ambria's best friend that was in the car accident with her, had a dream. Lily and her mom were sitting on the couch at their house when Ambria walked up the stairs. As she walked in, she said, hey guys, like she always would. She sat down on the couch and told Lily, dude, they fixed my femurs, but my feet are still broken. And she took off her slippers. (laughs) Then she got up, went into the kitchen to get a glass of water. And Lily asked, how are you walking without any support? Embry responded, I don't really know. And they both laughed and then Lily woke up. In Lily's dream, Embry's feet were still broken.
but we believe with all of our hearts that Ambria is present with God. Her body is whole, her feet are healthy, and that she is running, hitting a volleyball, and probably chasing a sunset. To the students of Green Hill, our high school group here at church, and anyone who was friends with Ambria, this is hard. You were not created to have to experience this. Give yourself permission to grieve how you need to grieve. Cry, scream, run, hide, do whatever you have to do, but do not do it alone. Sit with one another, check on one another, be near to one another, tell stories about her, keep saying her name. It may make your neighbor cry, but keep saying her name. We have to promise the family that we will not forget her. If you ever need to talk to someone about it, you're welcome to talk to me or any of the pastors here. We are here for you. To the extended family and the whole community, we must pledge today that we will not abandon the McGregors. They still need shoulders to cry on, space to scream and yell, and time and space to grieve on their own. What we must not forget is this. We must continue to say Ambria's name and tell Ambria's story. It may make them cry and maybe even shut down, but we must tell them anyway. The pain they feel will never go away. When we say Ambria's name, it will tell them that we miss her too. So we have to say it out loud so that they know we have not forgotten their daughter. To Ryder and Brittany and Dylan, we promise to keep saying her name to you, even if it makes you cry. We promise to continue to walk with you on this journey that you were not created to walk, but we will not let you walk it alone. You raised your daughter well, and she made an impact far greater than we even know in this moment. I don't believe that God did this or took her from us. I believe that God was here with us the whole time and never left us. He was in every person that cooked for you, in every embrace that held you close, in every hug where they let you cry and scream. He was in the hands of every nurse and doctor giving their all. And he was in the thumb that wiped away every tear, and he is still with us now, holding us in his arms. So what can we learn from the life of Ambria Diane McGregor? First, we learn that family matters. We learn to give up our own desires and sit down with the family's kids, investing ourselves in whatever they want to do. We learn to take selfies on our loved one's phones to bring joy to them. We learn to play hard and play to win. But even when we win, we make space for others to win too. We learn that the little things really do matter. Taking a ride with the music on with mom matters. Taking time to play cards with the family matters. Stopping where you are when the sun is setting to watch it matters. We learn that the way we live our lives matters. We should live our lives to where when people say our name, they cannot help but smile. Our smile should get stuck on our face and the light that lives inside of us will shine through to someone else every morning in a different car without ever having to say a word. We learn that the way of Jesus is always putting others first. We completely surrender to the ultimate life giver in our pursuit of letting him use us, even giving away the things that gave us life in the first place so that others may find it. We learn that no one deserves to suffer alone and that belonging to a church community gives us life and points us to the one who gives us life. We learn to show up for one another and share the burdens with one another. We're going to conclude this morning by singing a song that our high school students sing a lot. It's called Gratitude. It doesn't seem like the kind of song that should be sung at a time like this, but it's an anthem for our students and for Ambria too. I know, I 
I know because I've seen her sing it and get lost in worship. You can sit, you can stand, but worship with us.
behalf of the family one more time, I would like to thank you for being here today. The family would like to invite you to stay and eat a meal together. Yes, all of you. Brittany wants everyone to be smiling, eating, and sharing stories about Ambria. The food will be served out of our kitchen window, which is right behind this back wall behind you. If you are staying to eat, you can exit out the back right door, get in line, get a plate, and enter back through this door, and we will eat in here. Please make yourself at home and move chairs around as you so choose. If you would like to tell a story about Ambria, we ask that you keep the story to two to three minutes so that everyone can have a chance to tell their story if they choose to. We will stay seated until the McGregor family, or stay standing, stay still, until the McGregor family has had a chance to exit and get in line first, and then we will follow them in line. Thank you for your faithfulness to the family and for being present this afternoon. For those of you who did not get to visit with the family, or if you were in one of our overflow rooms, uh, they will come to you now. So we ask that you would stay there if you were in an overflow room so that they can visit with you, and then we will be dismissed. Thank you for being here this morning. You are dismissed. Big waves.